leave me by will a thousand crowns, in part my brother will breed me well. <coughs> and there begins my sadness. My brother Jacques, he keeps at school while he stays me here at home and kept. His horses are bread bent. But I, his brother, came nothing under him. The spirit of my father grows strong in me. And I will no longer endure it. Now, sir, what make you here? <laughs> I am not taught to make anything. Mary, sir, be better employed. <laughs> know you where you are, sir. Oh, sir, here in your orchard. Know you before whom, sir? I know you are my eldest brother, and you should know me. I have as much my father in me as you. What, boy? Come, come, elder brother. You are too young in this. Wilt thou lay hands on me, villain? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. He was my father, and he is thrice the villain that has such a father regard villains. Work thou not, my brother, I would not take this hand from thy throat to the other and pull out thy tongue for saying so. Sweet masters! Be patient. My father charged you as well to give me good education. You've trained me like a peasant. The spirit of my father grows strong in me, and I will no longer endure it. So therefore, give me the poor lottery my father left me. With that, I will go buy my fortunes. You, sir, will have some part of your will. Pray you leave me. And get you with him, you old dog. Is old dog my reward? Most true, I have lost my teeth in your service. I shall give no thousand crowns. Charles! Good morrow to your worship. <laughs> What's the new news at the new court? The old duke is banished by his younger brother, the new duke. Will Rosalind, the duke's daughter, be banished with her father? No, she is at the court. Where will the old duke live? They say he is already at the Forest of Arden, and many a merry of men with them, and there they live, like the old Robin Hood of England. You wrestle tomorrow before the new duke. Merry I do, sir. And your younger brother, Orlando, hath disposition to come in disguised against me. Your brother is but young and tender. I would loathe to foil him. I'll tell thee, Charles. It is the stubbornest young fellow of France, a villainous contriver against me, his natural brother. That, therefore, I had as life. Thou didst break his neck and his finger. For I assure thee, and... Almost with tears do I speak it. There is not one so young and villainous this day living. If he come, I will give him his pain. God keep your worship. Farewell, good Charles. My soul, I not know why, hates nothing more than he. But he's gentle, full of noble device, of all sorts enchantingly beloved. <laughs> but this wrestler, <laughs> he shall clear all. I pray thee, Rosalind, my cause be merry. Dear Celia, teach me to forget a banished father. You know my father hath no child but I, and when he dies, but he hath taken away from your father, I shall render thee again. Therefore, my sweet Rose, be merry. I will, cuz. And device sports. What think you of falling in love? Love no man in earnest. Here comes Monsieur Le Bon. Fair princess, you have lost much good sport. Sport? Of what color? Color, madam? How shall I answer you? I would have told you of good wrestling, and here, where you are, they are coming to perform it. Shall we see this wrestling, cousin? Uh, you must, if you stay here. Well, here's the place appointed for it. Yonder, sure they are coming. Let us stay and see it. Is yonder the man? Even he, madam. <laughs> he is too young. How now, daughter and cousin? Are you crept hither to see the wrestling? Aye, my liege. You will take little delight in it. In pity of the challenger's youth, I would dissuade him. But he will not be intrigued. Young man, have you challenged Charles the wrestler? Uh, I come as others do to 
defy the strength of my youth. We have seen cruel proof of his strength. We pray you, for your own sake, give over this attempt. Do, young sir. I be foiled. There is but one shame that was never gracious. He was killed, but one dead that was willing it be so. In a world I may take up a place with, it may be better to find once I've made it empty. Fare you well. Where is this young gallant that is so desirous to meet with his mother Earth? And you mean to mock me after? You should have not have mocked me before. But come your ways. Now, Hercules be thy speed, young man. thou, Charles? He cannot speak, my lord. Bear him away. What is thy name, young man? Orlando, my liege, the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. The world esteemed thy father honorable, but I did find him still mine enemy. Fare thee well. I would thou hadst told me of another father. I'm proud to be Sir Roland's son, his youngest son. Would not change that calling. My father loved Sir Roland as his soul. Good sir, you are well deserved. Gentlemen, <laughs> wear this for me. Shall we go, cuz? Aye, fare you well, fair gentlemen. Can I not say I thank you? For my better parts are all thrown down. He calls us back. I'll ask him what he would. Did you call, sir? Sir, you have wrestled well and overthrown more than your enemies. Fare you well. What passion hangs these weights upon my tongue? I cannot speak to her, yet she urged conference. Oh, poor Orlando, thou art overthrown. Good sir, leave this place. The Duke miscounters all you have done. Which of the two was daughter of the Duke? The taller is his daughter. The other is daughter to the banished Duke. Sir, fare you well. Fare you well. Thus from the smoke into the smother from tyrant duke unto tyrant brother. <coughs> By heavenly Rosalind. My cousin, why, Rosalind is all this for your father? No, some of it is for my child's father. Is it possible on such a sudden that you should fall into such strong a liking with the old Sir Roland's youngest son? The duke my father loved his father dearly. I should hate him, for my father hated his father dearly. Love him because I do. Look, here comes the duke, with his eyes full of anger. Mistress, dispatch you with your safest haste and get you from our court. Me, uncle? 
You, cousin, within these ten days, if that thou beest found so near our public court as twenty miles, thou diest for it. I do beseech your grace, let me the knowledge of my fault bear with me. Thou art thy father's daughter. There's enough. My father was no traitor. Celia, we stayed her for your sake, else had she with her father ranged along. If she be a traitor, why, so am I. She is too subtle for thee. Thou art a fool. Firm and irrevocable is my doom. She is banished. I cannot live out of her company. You are a fool. You, niece, provide yourself. If you outstay the time, you die. Let my father seek another heir. Say what thou canst. I'll go along with thee. Whither shall we go? To seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. I shall put myself in poor mean attire, the like do you, so we shall pass along and never stir silence. Were it not better, because I am more than common tall, I did suit me at all points like a man. What shall I call thee when thou art a man? Ganymede. But what shall you be called? No longer Celia, but Aliena. But cousin, what if we essayed to steal the clownish fool out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to our travels? He'll go along o'er the wide world with me. Leave me alone to woo him. Now let us go in content to liberty and not to banishment. Oh, oh, dear master! Why? What's the matter? Your brother hath heard your praises, and this night he means to burn down the lodging which you used to lie in, and you within it. Do not enter it. I have 500 crowns. All this I'll give you. Let me be your servant. <laughs> I know I look old, yet I am strong and lusty for... In my youth, I never did apply hot and rebellious liquors in my blood. I'll do the service of a younger man. Oh, good old man, that were not for the fashions of these times. We'll go along together. For seventeen years till now, almost four score. Here lived I, but live here no more. At seventeen years, many their fortunes do seek, but at four score, it's... Too late a week. <clears throat> oh, Jupiter, how weary are my spirits. I care not for my spirits, for my legs not so weary. Courage, good Aliana. I pray you, bear with me. I can go no further. Oh, I would rather bear with you than bear you. <laughs> well, this is the forest of Arden. Oh! Now am I in Arden? When I was at home, I was in a better place. Look you, who comes here? If thou rememberest not the slightest folly that ever love did make thee run into, thou hast not love. Or if thou hast not sat as I do now, wearing thy hearer and thy mistress's praise, <laughs> thou hast not love. Or if thou hast not broke company abruptly as my passion now makes me, thou hast not loved. <laughs> oh, Phoebe! 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 The shepherd's passion is much upon my fashion. <laughs> Question, young man, if for gold he will give us any food. I faint almost to death. I prithee, shepherd, bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed. Here lies a young maid with travel much oppressed and faints for succor. I wish my fortune were more able to relieve her and at our sheep coat now. There is nothing that you will feed on. But what is? Come see. Most welcome shall you be. Yeah. Oh, master, I can go no further. Oh, I die for food. Here lie I down and mark me out my grave. 
Why, how now, Adam? Live a little. If this uncouth forest yield anything savage, I will either be food for it or bring it to food for thee. Hold death a while at arm's end. For here I shall bury you some shelter, and thou shalt not die for lack of dinner. Surely, good Adam. Now, my co-mates and brothers in exile, are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we but the penalty of Adam, the season's difference, as the icy fang and the churlish chidings of the winter wind, which, when they bite and blow upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, I smile and say, this is no flattery. These are counselors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity. And this, our life exempt from public haunts, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stone, and good in everything. <laughs> Hello, ah! monsieur. You look merrily. A fool. A fool. I met a fool in the forest. A motley fool. A miserable world. As I do live by food, I met a fool who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms. In good set terms. <coughs> and yet a motley fool. Good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he, call me not fool till heaven hath sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with lackluster eye, says, Very wisely, it is ten o'clock. Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more, it will be eleven. And so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. When I did hear the motley fool thus moral on the time, my lungs began to grow like Chanticleer, <laughs> that fools should be so deep contemplative, and I did laugh since intermission an hour by his dial. Oh, that I were a fool! I am ambitious for a motley coat. Thou shalt have one. Invest me in my motley. Give me leave to speak my mind, and I will through and through cleanse the foul body of the infected world. Thou thyself hast been a libertine. <laughs> Prepare and eat no more. Why, I have eaten none yet. Prepare, I say. He dies that touches any of this fruit till I and my affairs are answered. And you will not be answered with reason. I must die. <laughs> what would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost died for food, and let me have it. Sit down and feed, and welcome to our table. Speak you so gently. Pardon me. I thought all things had been savage here. But forbear your food a little while. There's an old poor man who, after me, had limped in pure love. Till he be first sufficed, I will not touch a bit. We will nothing waste till you return. Thou seest, we are not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's <laughs> arms. 
Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail, unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. Then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice in fair <laughs> round belly with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again to our childish treble, <laughs> pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all, that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Welcome. Let him feed. I thank you most for him. As you must. I scarce can speak to thank you for myself. You are the son of the good Sir Roland. Be truly welcome hither. I am the Duke that loved your father. Good old man. Give me your hand and let me all your fortunes understand. Not see him since? Sir, sir, that cannot be. But were I not the better part made mercy, I should not seek an absent argument of my revenge, thou present. But look to it. Find out thy brother, wheresoe'er he is, Seek him with candle, bring him dead or living within this twelve month, or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. Thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine worth seizure do we seize into our hands, till thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee. Oh, that your highness knew my heart in this. I've never loved my brother in my life. More villain thou. Well, push him out of doors and let my officers of such a nature make extent upon his house and land. Do this expediently, and turn him going. Oh, Rosalind, these trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts I'll character, and every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree, the fair, the chaste, the unexpressive she. From the east to western end, no jewel is like Rosalind. All the picture's fairest lines are but black to Rosaline. Let no face be kept in mind but the fair of Rosaline. <laughs> I'll rhyme you so eight years together for a taste. Winter garments must be lined, so must slender Rosaline. Sweetest nut hath sourest rind, such a nut is Rosaline. He that sweetest rose must find, must find love's prick. And Rosaline, this is a very false gallop of verses. I found them on a tree. Well, truly then, the tree yields bad fruit. Hmm? Didst thou hear these verses? Oh, yes. Without wondering how thy name should be hanged and carved upon these trees, 
show you who hath done this. Is it a man? <laughs> and a chain you once wore about your neck? Change you color? Nay, tell me who it is. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And yet again, wonderful. Take the cork out of your mouth that I may drink thy tidings. So you may put a man in your belly. What manner of man? Is his head worth a hat? His chin worth a beard? Nay, he hath little beard. Let me stay the growth of his beard if thou delay me not the knowledge of his chin. It is young Orlando who tripped up the wrestler's heels and your heart both in an instant. Nay, but the devil take mocking. Speak sad brow and true maid. In faith, cuz, tis he. Orlando? Orlando! Huh, what shall I do with my doublet and hose? Doth he know I'm in this forest and in man's apparel? I found him under a tree, stretched along like a wounded knight. Though it be a pity to see such a sight, it well becomes the ground. A cry hollow to thy tongue. Do you not know that I'm a woman? When I think I must speak. Soft, comes he not here? Tis he. Slink by and note him. Let's meet as little as we can. I do desire we may be better strangers. Mar no more trees with writing love songs in their barks. Mar no more my verses with reading them ill-favoredly. Rosalind is your love's name? Yes. <laughs> I do not like her name. There was no thought of pleasing you when she was christened. What stature is she of? Just as high as my heart. You are full of pretty answers. I was seeking a fool when I found you. He's drowned in the brook. Look in, and you shall see him. There I shall see mine own figure. Which I take to be a fool. Farewell, senor love. Adieu, good monsieur melancholy. I will speak to him. Forrester, what is it o'clock? You should ask me what time of day. There's no clock in the forest. Then there's no lover in the forest, else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect time as well as a clock. Where dwell you, pretty youth? With this shepherdess, my sister, here in the skirts of the forest. Your accent is something finer. An old uncle of mine taught me to speak, who is in love. I've heard him read many lectures against women. Can you remember the evils that he laid to women? I will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick. There is a man haunts the forest that hangs odes upon the hawthorns, deifying the name Rosalind. I would give him some good counsel. I am he. My uncle taught me how to know a man in love. You are not. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. Then your hose should be ungartered, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. You are no such man. But are you he that hangs the verses on the trees? I am that unfortunate he. Love is merely of madness. Yet, I profess curing it. Did you ever cure any? Yes, one. He was to imagine me, his love, his mistress, and I set him about every day to woo me, at which time I would be changeable, proud, apish, shallow, full of tears, full of smiles, now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him. And thus I cured him, and in this way I will wash your liver clean. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you, if you would but call me Rosalind, and come every day to woo me. I will. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? <coughs> come apace, good Audrey. Am I the man yet? What? Truly, I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Is it honest? No, truly. Would you not have me honest? No, truly. <laughs> a material fool. Well, I am not fair, and therefore I pray the gods make me honest. Well, to cast honesty upon a foul slut would be to put good meat in an unclean dish. 
I am not a slut, though I thank the gods I am foul. <laughs> well, <laughs> praise be the gods for thy foulness. Though sluttishness may come hereafter, but I will marry thee. Sir Oliver Martext has agreed, agreed to meet us here in the woods and couple us this very day. I would see this meeting. Well, the gods give us joy. Here comes Sir Oliver now. <clears throat> Is there no one here to give this woman? You know, she must be given, or this marriage is not lawful. Proceed, proceed. I'll give her. Uh, you are very well met, sir. Nay, pray, be covered. Will you be married, Motley? <laughs> As the ox hath his bow, sir, so doth man have his desires. Uh, get you to church and have a good priest. This fellow will but join you together as they join Wayne Scott. Then one of you will prove a shrunk panel and like a green timber warp. Warp! But he may not marry me well, sir, and having not been married well, it may give me good reason, therefore, someday to then leave my wife. Let me counsel thee. Ah, come away, Audrey. We must be married or live in Baudry. Oh, brave Oliver, I shall not be married with thee this day. Is no matter, sir. Never talk to me. I will weep. Have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? As good cause as one would desire. Therefore, weep. But why did he swear he would come this morning, and comes not? There is no truth in him. Not true in love? Yes, when... He is in love, but I think he is not in. You've heard him swear he was. Was is not is. He writes brave verses, speaks brave words, swears brave oaths, and breaks them bravely. Who comes here? Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Thou tellest me there is murder in mine eyes. Now, I do frown on thee with all my heart. And if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. I'm sure there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. Come not near me. I shall not pity thee. Who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched? What, though you have no beauty, must you be therefore proud and pitiless? Why, what means this? Why do you look on me? I think she means to tangle my eyes, too. No, faith proud mistress, hope not after it. Tis not your inky brows or your bugle eyeballs that can entail my spirits to your worship. You are a thousand times a proper man than she a woman. Tis fools such as you that make the world full of ill-favored children. But mistress, know yourself, down on your knees, and thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can, you are not for all markets. Sweet youth, I had rather hear you chide than this man woo. I pray you do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than vows made in wine. Besides, I like you not. Shepherd, ply her hard. Shepherdess, look on him better. Ah, good day and happiness, dear. Rosalind. Where have you been? I come within an hour of my promise. And you be so tardy, come no more in my sight. But come, woo me, woo me, for now I am in a holiday humor and like enough to consent. Am I not your Rosalind? I take some joy to say you are. Well, I will not have you. Then I die. No, Faith, the poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in that time there's not been any man to die from a love cause. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but never for love. But now I will be your Rosalind in a more coming-on disposition. Ask me what you will. Love me, Rosalind. Yes, Fridays and Saturdays and all. And, uh, wilt thou have me? And twenty such. What? Are you not good? I hope so. Why, then, can one desire too much of a good thing? Come, sister. You shall be the priest and marry us. Give me your hands, Orlando. What say you, sister? 
I cannot say the words. Will you, Orlando? Will you, Orlando, have to wife this Rosalind? Uh, I will. Aye, but when? Why, as fast as she can marry us. Then you must say, I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. Now tell me how long you would have her. Forever and a day. Say a day, without the ever. No, no, Orlando, men are like April when they whoop, December when they wed. I will be jealous, clamorous, oh. giddy. I will weep for nothing when you are disposed to be merry. I will laugh when thou art inclined to sleep. But will my Rosalind do this? She will do as I do. Oh, but she is wise. Or else she would not have the wit to do this. Make the doors upon a woman's wit, twill out of the casement. Shut that, twill out of the keyhole. Stop that, twill fly with the smoke out the chimney. For these two hours, Rosalind, I will leave thee. I must attend the Duke at dinner, but by two o'clock I will be with thee again. I knew what you would prove. My friends told me as much. And so, come, death. Two o'clock is your hour? Aye, sweet Rosalind. If you come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most unworthy of her you call Rosalind. Therefore, keep your promise. Oh, my pretty little cuz, that thou didst know how deep I am in love. And my affection hath an unknown bottom, like the Bay of Portugal. Or rather, bottomless, that as soon as you pour affection in, it runs out. I cannot be out of the sight of Orlando. I'll find a shadow and sigh till he come. I'll sleep. Whoever loved did love not at first sight. Silvius, since that thou canst speak of love so well, Thy company I'll endure, and I'll employ thee, too. But do not look for recompense. Loose now and then a scattered smile, and that I'll live upon. Knowest thou the youth that spoke to me? Not very well. Well, it is a pretty youth, not very pretty. He's not very tall, and yet for his years he's tall, and his leg is but so-so, and yet tis well. Well, there be some women would have gone near to fall in love with him. I'll write to him a very taunting letter, and thou wilt bear it. Wilt thou, Silvius? Phoebe, with all my heart. I'll write it straight. Go with me, Silvius. Not past two o'clock, he hath taken his bow and arrow and gone forth to sleep. My gentle Phoebe, bid me give you this. She says I am not fair, that I lack manners. She calls me proud. Well, Shepherd, well, this is a letter of your own device. No, uh, Phoebe did write it. This is a man's invention. It is hers. Will you hear the letter? So please you, for I've not heard it yet, yet heard too much of Phoebe's cruelty. <clears throat> Art thou God to shepherd turn that a maiden's heart hath burned? Can a woman rail thus? Call you this, railing. Alas, poor shepherd. Wilt thou love such a woman? Go and say to her, if she love me, I charge her to love thee. If she will not, I will never have her. Good morrow, fair one. Pray you, where in this forest stands a sheep coat fenced about with olive trees? West of this place, but at this hour there's none within. I know you by description. Are you not owners of the house? We are. Orlando doth commend him to you both, and to the youth he calls his Rosalind, he doth send this bloody napkin. Are, are you he? I am. What must we understand by this? Some of my shame. Orlando left with a promise to return. Yet, while pacing through the forest, lo, what befell? A ragged, wretched man lay sleeping on his back, and about his neck a green and gilded snake had wreathed itself. 
who with their head approached the opening of the man's mouth. But suddenly, upon seeing Orlando, it did slip away under the brush, into which a lioness lay couching. This scene, Orlando did approach the man, and found it was his brother, his older brother. I have heard him speak of this brother, the most unnatural that lived amongst men. And well, I know he was unnatural. But Orlando, did he leave him there? Who to the hungry lioness? <sighs> Twice did he turn his back. But kindness, much nobler than revenge, made him give battle to the lioness, who quickly fell before him in which, hurtling from miserable slumber, did I awaken. Are you his brother? I do not shame to say what I once was since my conversion. So sweetly tastes, being the thing that I am. Upon his arm the lioness did tear some flesh away, which all the while it had bled. I bound his wound. He then sent me hither to tell this story and to give you this napkin to the youth he doth call in sport his Rosalind. Oh, why, how now? Ganymede! Oh, sweet Ganymede! A mini swoon at the sight of blood. There's, there's more in it. Oh, I would I were at home. Thou lacks a man's heart. Tell your brother how well I counterfeited. Counterfeit? This was not counterfeit. Counterfeit, I assure you. Counterfeit to be a man. So I do. Uh, good sir, go with us. That will I. But I pray you, commence my counterfeiting. Will you go? There will come a time for us, Audrey. Faith, the priest was good enough. Oh, a most evil Sir Oliver. But Audrey, a man in the forest lays claim to you. I can please the man you mean. Good even, Audrey. Good even, William. Is thy name William? William, sir. Do you love this maid? I do, sir. Art thou learned, William? No, sir. Then learn this. Drink while being poured from a cup into a glass. One must be emptied so the other may be filled. And while all of your writers do consent that Ipsy is he, for you are not Ipsy, now I am he. Which he do you mean, sir? He that would marry this woman, therefore clown, abandon, which in the vulgar is leave, the society, which in the boorish is company, this woman, which in the common is female, which together is abandon the society of this woman, or thou perishest, or to simplify, thou diest, or to wit, I kill thee. I will deal with thee in cold steel. I will deal with thee in poison. I will overrun thee with policy. I will kill thee 150 different ways. Therefore, clown, tremble and depart. Do, good William. God rest you, Mary, sir. Trip, Audrey, I attend. Is it possible on so little acquaintance that you should love and she should grant? I love Aliana. And it is your good that the revenue of old Sir Roland I will estate upon you and live here a shepherd. You have my consent. Let your wedding be tomorrow. Invite the Duke and all as follows. God save you, brother. And you, fair sister. Did your brother tell you how I counterfeited to swoon? And greater wonders that. Oh, I know. For your brother and my sister no sooner met, but they loved. No sooner loved, but they asked one another the reason. No sooner knew the reason, but they sought the remedy. The, their wedding shall be tomorrow. The more shall I be heart heavy. I can live no longer by thinking. If you love Rosalind, when your brother marries Aliana, shall you marry her? Speakest thou in sober meanings? I do. Look, here comes a lover of mine and a lover of hers. You. You have done me much ungentleness. I care not. Look upon him. Love him. He worships you. Good shepherd, tell this youth what is to love. It is to be all made of sighs and tears. And so am I for Phoebe. And so am I for Ganymede. <laughs> 
And so am I for Rosalind. And so am I for no woman. It is to be all made of faith and service. And so am I for Phoebe. And so am I for Ganymede. And so am I for Rosalind. And so am I for no woman. It is to be all made of fantasy, all made of passion, and all made of wishes, all humbleness, all patience, and impatience. And so am I for Phoebe. And so am I for Ganymede. And so am I for Rosalind. And so am I for no woman. Well, if this be so, then why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? Who do you speak to, why blame you me to love you? To her that is not here, not doth not hear. No more of this. Tis like the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. I will help you if I can. I would love you if I could. Tomorrow meet me all together. I will marry you if I ever marry woman, and you shall be married tomorrow. I will satisfy you if ever I satisfy man, and you shall be married tomorrow. I will content you if what pleases you contents you, and you shall be married tomorrow. As you love Rosalind, meet. As you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I'll meet. I'll not fail if I live. Nor I. Nor I. Tomorrow will we be married, Audrey. I do desire it with all my heart, and I hope it is no dishonest desire to be a woman of the world. Uh, look, here comes the banished duke. Come, Audrey. Dost thou believe, Orlando, the boy can do all he has promised? I sometimes do, and hmm, sometimes do not. You say, if I bring in your Rosalind, you will bestow her on Orlando. That would I. And you will have her? That would I. You say you'll marry me. That I will. But if you do refuse to marry me, you'll give yourself to this most faithful shepherd? So is the bargain. <laughs> Keep you your word. From hence I go, to make these doubts all even. There is sure another flood, and these couples are coming to the ark. Here comes a pair of very strange beasts. Uh, greetings and salutations to you all. Uh, good, my lord, like this fellow. I like him very well. We press in here, sir, with the rest of the country. Copulatives to swear and to forswear. A, a poor virgin, sir. An ill-favored thing, but mine own. <laughs> Is not this a rare fellow, my lord? Good Duke, receive thy daughter. Hymen from heaven brought her, that thou mightest join her hand with his, whose heart within her bosom is. To you I give myself, for I am yours. To you I give myself, for I am yours. If there is truth in sight, you are my daughter. If there be truth in sight, you are my Rosalind. Well, if sight and shape be true, why then, my love, adieu. Peace! Tis I must make conclusion of these most strange events. You and you, no cross shall part. You and you are heart and heart. You to his love must accord, or have woman to your Lord. You and you are sure together as the winter to foul weather. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear niece, welcome thou art to me, even daughter welcome in no less degree. I will not eat my word. Now thou art mine. Let me have audience for a word or two. I am the second son of old Sir Roland. Duke Frederick addressed a mighty power purposely to take his brother here and put him to the sword. And to the skirts of the wild wood he came, where meeting with an old religious man 
after some question with him, was converted from both his enterprise and from the world. His crown bequeathing to his banished brother, and all the lands restored to them again that were with him exiled. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, young man. First, in this forest, let us do those ends which here were well begun and well begot. And after, every of our happy number shall share in the good of our return fortune. Meantime, forget this new fallen dignity and fall into our rustic revelry. Play music. We will begin these rites as we do trust they'll end in true delight. Not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, but tis no more handsome than to see the lord the prologue. My way is to conjure you, and I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering none of you hates them, that between you and the women this play may please. As I'm a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that liked me, complexions that pleased me, and breaths that I defied not, and, I am sure, as many as have good beards, or good faces, or sweet breaths, will, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell. 